So we're going to questions now, Terry and Fuzzleen. Welcome back, Fuzzleen. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, David and Terry, for the very uh, interesting presentation and discussion. So yeah, let's uh, move on to uh, the most exciting part of the forum, actually, which is the Q&A session. Um, uh, we have received um, some questions uh, from the audience today, and I think um, uh, it has been addressed uh, by Terry. So let's uh, take uh, a look at some of the questions that we received uh, prior to this forum. So um, let's uh, look at the first uh, question. I think, David, I need to take control of the, yes. <laughs> of the presentation slide again. Okay. Yes. All right. You we'll do that. Okay. You're the driver from here on in. Yeah, that's right. Don't okay. Question number one from Jonathan Ambrose. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the questions that you sent earlier on. So, um, David or Theory, please. Uh, relationship of gas lift with slug flow. Um, do we have that there? Here we go. I'll, yeah. I'll give you what my answer was. And Jonathan, thanks for the question. And this is what I wrote. Um, the question is very general. So I'll try to cover what I think you may, may have mean. A well may slug on natural flow for various reasons. The same with gas lift. Um, the tubing could be too large, increased water cut, inefficient gas lift injection. Your gas lift orifice is too big. Reservoir performance, oh, interference from other wells. So the aim is to minimise slug flow by ensuring you are lifting as deep as possible, your gas lift valves are properly sized, and your injection rate is tuned. Some of the other things like tubing size, reservoir performance, interference from other wells, or the process are a different bucket of problems. But of course, as the gas lift person I said before, you will be expected to solve them because it's always a gas lift problem. I hopefully that um, address the slug flow. I think that's very good to reply, uh, David. I think if I can add on to that, I think sometimes you get uh, slug flow uh, when you, uh, it could be that you, you could have been uh, having a uh, multi-pointing from the uh, the different gas valves. So imagine that you have certain valve that is, uh, you know, alternating injecting uh, between the different valve settings. You can see that as the uh, the gas dry up to surface because they are coming at different times, that sometimes uh, recognized by the operator as lugging. But actually, it's not really the worst lugging. It's just that the gas is not injecting in a continuous manner. Okay. All right, Jonathan. I hope uh, that uh, that's answer your question. So let's move on to the second questions that we receive. Um, in case LGR is higher than actual and injection pressure is unable to open orifice, can this um, IPO valve considered as orifice? From okay. Muhammad Abidi. Hi, Muhammad. Uh, thanks again. I'm again probably me getting old and I'm a little bit confused um, by your question. I gather by LGR is lift gas rate is higher than actual. Um, you mean, do you mean is higher than what um, is required or may not be? I'm not sure there. But anyway, if your injection pressure is not able to get you to the orifice, I've answered um, that the required rate and pressure to operate, optimize the well, is higher than you have available. That's what I assume you're saying. So the second point is the orifice is always open because it's an orifice. IPO have opening closing pressures and can be used to lift if you require. Um, it's not ideal, but you can use your deepest unloading valve to use to lift the well as an orifice. But remember, you're flowing some high rates through a valve that is, has other moving parts, so you could cut the valve. And you need to know what the reason for not being able to unload down to the orifice is. Is your valve design wrong? Uh, were the temperatures set wrongly in the workshop? Uh, is your compression presser lower than expected? So why is that? The production profile of the well is incorrect. So you're unable to get differential at the orifice. So there's a number of things you have to look at. And hopefully that answered your question, unless Terry has another interpretation of the question. No, I think I, I, I will agree with your replies, uh, David, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So next. Okay. Um, at the same time, I have also uh, opened up the microphone and uh, for Mr. Jim Hall, since he's here in order uh, in our audience today. Uh, so maybe David or Terry would like to do an introduction to uh, Mr. Jim Hall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is he is he live yet, Mr. Yes, Jim? He is alive. Yes. Hey, He's Jim. Alive. Hi. Hi, Jim. Good hey. heavens! It's a long time since I've heard that voice. But uh, <laughs> welcome and glad to hear that you're still awake. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's late, but I'm here. Good, good. And Bongo, is he there? He's here and still very fuzzy. Okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> I miss Bongo. Yeah, we all miss Bongo. Uh, Bongo is uh, Jim's um, technical assistant. He's a little fuzzy monkey that used to travel with us around the world. Uh, Mr. Jim Hall is, um, is a walking library of uh, gas lift, um, drilling, production, troubleshooting, wireline, gas well delicification facts. Uh, the man has a brain the size of, I don't know what, but he used to have a big cupboard behind him and you could ask him a question, he would turn around and it was filled with reference material. And within half a second, he would reach for that piece of material, he would pull it out and he would go exactly to the page and give it to you to read. I read too much. Yeah, <laughs> but an amazing man. And he had a mother who used to beat him with a big stick if he ever got his grammar <laughs> wrong or spelling yeah, wrong. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Jim and I spent a lot of time together and a lot of fun times and a lot of places traveling the world, um, doing really great things and um, enjoying people. And I think he was a very strong mentor of Terry's as well. So Indeed, Jim, yeah, welcome. I, I learned many things from Jim Hall. Really appreciate that, Jim. Hopefully most of them were useful. <laughs> Very useful, actually, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, so far you're doing well with it. Now, thanks Thank for uh, thanks for making use of a lot of the materials that that I developed with uh, colleagues over the years. Um, David, especially, we we spent a lot of time traveling the world, trying to fix gas lift problems, and and we always tried to leave things with the people knowing how to fix the problem, so they wouldn't keep calling us on the phone. Yeah, but the people were the problem, weren't they, Jim? Yeah, sometimes <laughs> that was the case. <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Jim, you can uh, stay on and uh, you know, participate in some of the questions and answers that we're receiving. So we have uh, two more questions uh, from the audience, today's audience. Um, the first question is, can you comment on interactions between wells? Example, one well unstable, does it make other wells um, Otherwise, unstable. Um, anyone would um, like to take up the yes. question? Um, well, I'll start off saying that um, age before beauty on all of these things. Um, of course, uh, every well is part of a system. And I'll just do this in a, in a general statement. Every well is part of a system. So everything in, you do in that system will have an impact on every other well or every other piece of kit that works on pressure or flow in that system. Um, you may even have um, a uh, water injection well that's in your, uh, in your field and you turn it on, turn it off, and all of a sudden you'll see problems with some of your other wells. There may be a group of wells that are affected. It may only be one individual well, but yes, you have to know what's going on. It's all about well and reservoir management Anything to add, Terry or Jim? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying the first thing you said is exactly correct. You're not dealing with individual wells, you're dealing with a system. And if you have one well that's creating problems in the production system, uh, surging pressure surges and pressure fluctuations, those pressures come back to the other wells and are reflected from the surface all the way down to the perforations. Mm -hmm. It's especially a problem if you have production pressure operated valves in the well where changes in wellhead pressure can cause your valves downhole to open and close. Uh, that problem is not nearly as severe with 
injection pressure operated valves. As long as you have your a good casing pressure drop to close your unloading valves and keep them closed, even if you get fluctuations in production pressure. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, on another question, any pointers on lifting um, unstable wells with very long, highly deviated segments causing uh, gas to separate above the liquid? Uh, try single port injection with a larger port size or smaller ports and accept multi pointing to reduce slagging. Uh, anyone to long long horizontal yeah long horizontal uh -huh. sections yes they can produce slugging mm -hmm. a lot of wells will slug uh, no matter what um, gas lift as the bubbles recoalesce as you go up the well it creates slugs so it's all about the available pressures and flow rates you have in the system um, larger orifice no. Um, I think a more tuned orifice to what is needed. Mm -hmm. uh, remembering that um, you can put gas lift as deep as you want, but you are limited by wireline on deviation. So if you're getting want to get close, you don't go below the packer on gas lift, and you can't, um, in most cases, go above 60 degrees because you can't get a valve in and out. So therefore your gas lift is normally in the top section of the uh, of the well. Uh, to that point, the secret is, um, you've probably seen a post, some of the people of late about a thing called small bubbles. And that was the holy grail of gas lift was to generate enough small bubbles to stop slug flow. Uh, that's my input on that at the moment, but uh, Jim or Terry? I think if I can add on that, if I remember, I think both David and Jim, I think at one point you guys were looking at uh, electrical uh, gas lift valve, right? To be installed on the uh, horizontal sections. Correct. And yeah. um, yeah. there, is, there, is a, uh, there is a version of that, which is called Dial, um, which has now been installed in a couple of wells. Jim may know more as to what's happening with that, but it's a, um, it's a surface control gas lift valve, which I think has six uh, openings that you can open and close to adjust um, the amount of gas that you are injecting into a well. But it's called Dial, D-I-A-L, and I think it's called by Silverwell. Yes. Yes. Now, the advantage of the Silverwell well system is, as you say, each mandrel has uh, actually six valves in it each one has a different size port. So the depending, rather than having one valve that you throttle open and close, you open a certain number of fixed port orifices at each one of the mandrels. And the advantage of it is, is this is a permanent installation. You can, you can install them in wells, um, at, uh, even horizontal, because it goes in with the tubing and there's no uh, wireline servicing that ever needs to be done on them. Uh, the key problem with uh, long horizontal sections in gas lift wells is the tubing tends to act like a separator and the gas will run over the top and the liquids will fall back and go back down the well on the bottom. And there's one, two things to do. You can either live with the slugs that will be produced from that or if you've got a lot of gas to spare, which usually we don't. Uh, if you've got lots of gas, you can inject the gas at a very high rate to achieve mist flow in the horizontal section of the well. Uh, but but the, the rule in any gas lift field is that gas lift demand rises to and then exceeds all available supply. <laughs> so you usually don't have that much gas available. So you usually can't achieve mist flow. So with long horizontal sections, you end up having to deal with slug flow once it turns vertical. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we actually running out of time. So let's take uh, maybe uh, uh, one sorry, more question. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the third that's question our, that we've received. That's our guard dog. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he wants to join our our forum. <laughs> yes, he wants to like guest leave as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a she. Okay. Oh, I always wants to have the last word. <laughs> okay, question from Nur Shaida Ismail: Is the death of uh, valve effect the optimization, David? Yeah, this is a good question. I think everyone will agree with me. The valve depth is critical in optimization. The first rule of gas lift, and if you keep this in the back of your mind, is lift as deeply as possible. So the deeper you lift from, that gives you the, the best optimization or ability to optimize the well. So this is to ensure that the greatest length of production tubing is aerated, affected by the injected gas. And I think Probably that's the simplest way of putting it. I think, Nor, you're very, very new to gas lift and you, we don't want to uh, fill your brain with too many long words or complicated things. Mm -hmm. uh, any input, Jerry, uh, on this particular question? So you're okay <laughs> with David's answer? Yeah, I think that answer was actually... <laughs> Okay, last question uh, that we're going to answer before we call off the, the session. Uh, question number four from Ashish uh, Shital. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Apologize if it's not. Uh, how to detect multi-porting and shallow injection using surveillance? Uh, and I think uh, David has prepared quite an extensive uh, answer to this question. Okay, we actually went through this at the, um, the end of my presentation, but Ashish, welcome. That's a good question, which has several answers or options, and I assume you meant multi-pointing. Um, looking at well performance, you see over injection of gas lift gas into the well, unstable production, unstable injection as valves open and close, and well tests indicate a rate drop or an increase of total gas out. So this will give you an, an indication. Uh, the most popular method is to run a flowing gradient survey uh, with stops above and below each mandrel. This of recourse requires wine line entry, a crew, equipment, including a production operator on site. The data then needs to be analysed and interpreted, and then you look for variations of pressure and temperature at each stop to indicate gas being injected. The most efficient and accurate that does not require wire line and can be effectively run on, on dual gas lifted wells also is a tracer survey with a slug of CO2 is injected with a gas lift gas, monitored with specific tools and software at the surface with results immediately sent to the office so you can do a redesign. And you can see on the plot down the bottom here where we have a, a, a change, and in some cases a change in slope above and below each of the mandrels, indicating that there's something happening at each of these mandrels. Some of them are very suspicious because you see there's a, there's a drop in pressure at the first mandrel above to below. So um, it's, that's the simple answer. Um, the long answer is um, make sure you uh, get some training where you go into this <laughs> in depth. Um, but if anyone else would like to add to that, um, I think they're the two most uh, effective ways of uh, looking for multi-pointing. Or you could go also go back and have a look at your design and see if something might have been wrong in the design and what went out. One of the things about um, your valves, when they do go to the field, um, they leave the workshop and you don't know how they're going to work until they're in the well and the well's bought online. And there is a thing uh, called an AVT, which is a, a piece of kit that you can actually run every valve into before it leaves the workshop. And it runs a, a series of tests. Um, and these tests then give a seal of approval or a passport for that valve to go out and be run in the world, that it's passed all of the opening and closing pressures, uh, load rates, uh, stem travel, all of those things. And there are a number of these around the world, and I think they are still commercially available, and they're not that expensive. In fact, some workshops around the world do have AVTs. That's about it from me. Thank you, 
I, I think if I can add on, I think, uh, I think uh, David has already uh, touched on earlier is the use of DTS. So a DTS would be another piece of technology. Uh, assuming that you have a world that is created with DTS, that actually is quite a good tool for uh, sporting multi-pointing. Yes. Okay. One thing, uh, one thing I might be able to add to that is, mm -hmm. is to make, make use of the knowledge of your field operators. Field operators know the wells. They know the personality of the wells. They know how they behave. They don't know the fancy engineering terms to attach to it. But if you'll spend time in the field with your production operator and talk to them about the wells and let them explain oh, this well does this, and how come this well makes this noise? And you can eventually learn an awful lot from them because they spend more time with those wells than you do. You won't get it, get it exactly right every time, but the information that they can give you is quite beneficial when you can couple it with the engineering and technology, technical work that you do. And that's an important point too, um, Jim, just tweak my brain into gear again, that one of the things we said earlier is to provide your operators and people in the field um, with information about their wells, to give them some training, to get them up to understand what's happening. One of the things is that remembering your unloading valves have opening and closing pressures. In those calculations, there's a surface gauge opening and a surface gauge closing, which tells you what the casing pressure should be at the surface at each of the valves for it to open and close. Now, if you have production a process upset and there's a shut-in and then you bring the wells back on, if your operators have a list of the opening and closing pressures of each of the valves in their well, they can then look at the trending they've got and see if the casing pressure in that well has actually dropped below the closing pressure of all the valves and all the valves are closed. And that's another simple way of do having a quick look to see if you've got any extra valves open. Okay, um, we have a, 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 an audience that raised his hand to, uh, to ask a question. So let's uh, um, invite uh, J.O. Fazili Muhammad to actually uh, voice his questions to uh, the panelists. Uh, you please? So, Fazili? He's muted at the moment. Okay. I've actually asked him to unmute. No? Okay, um, let's, um, while um, um, getting him to, to, to get ready to ask this question, let's move on to the last question that we have um, received from the audience. Uh, this is actually um, a question <laughs> from Jim. He wanted to test uh, both of you probably. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference I, between well flow test accuracy and reportability? <laughs> Jim's testing. Jim's testing me. What answer yeah. do I give? <laughs> uh, me as well. <laughs> you, you want me to answer that one? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Let him. Why let not? him see. Let him see the answer I gave, and then he can, and I won't say anything, and then he can answer. <laughs> so is go. there? Oh, you didn't put the answer up. There's no answer. <laughs> There's no answer. We have not okay. uh, because we received this this morning, so we, we, we didn't quite prepare the, the, the answer yet. Okay, I'll let you answer, Jim. <laughs> okay, when when I was I spent 15 years in production operations, and so I tested a lot of wells, and the one of the problems was if I turned in a well test, and it wasn't kind of close to the one before that, they give me a hard time and say, go back and retest this well. And I'd say, why, why should I retest the well? They said, well, the well's still online. It's still producing and ought to produce pretty close to what it did last time. So we're looking for repeatability in the tests. And I said, but what if something's wrong with the well? What if the well is sick? Uh, wouldn't you rather have an accurate test than just a repeatable test? And they kind of grumbled a little bit because <laughs> if, 
if they got a re repeatable test, they didn't have to do anything. But if they got a well test that was accurate and not close to the last well test, then there was a problem and they had some more work to do. So what we want in well tests is we want our well test to be accurate. It doesn't matter whether it's the same as the last test or whether the next test is close to the one you just took. You, you need accuracy to do proper analysis of a well. And repeatability is easy to do. You can use that cheap test separator that David held up a little earlier. <laughs> and you can make repeatable well tests with a pen, no problem at all. So if, you, if you've got a choice between having accurate well tests and repeatable well tests, pick accurate every time. Thank okay. you. That's, that's sort of what Thank I you. said. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, since we are running out of time, we only have uh, one, uh, we'll be accepting only one last question. Um, okay, um, the, the last question is, do you have experience injecting gas through capillary uh, tubes in the horizontal section? I know it is used uh, in USA mostly in, in shale wells. Uh, maybe Jim would like to answer okay. this question. They were talking about cap 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 strings, capillary tubes, yeah, yeah. Yes. and and calcium mm -hmm. gas or shale. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, down. yeah. And so so what they'll do in some cases is you'll run a a, a concentric string, uh, like a coiled tubing string, and the the gas you can shove the coiled tubing all the way down to the to the end of the perforated section or the end of the frac section uh, and you push the gas down at the end, the horizontal section, you've got high velocities moving the liquids, keeping it from separating uh, and keeping the gas from, from jetting along the top. So yes, that's done. The, the first time I remember that was about 1990, 1991 in the Bakken Shale when I worked for Conoco, uh, but it's very commonly done. The important thing is, is to know, know where your, the end of your coil or the end of your cap string is, control how much gas is going through there. And again, be able to get decent tests on the well so you can model the performance. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for all the excellent questions uh, that lead us to a very good discussion today. Uh, if there's any more unanswered questions, do look up in the follow-up email uh, that we will soon, uh, we will send soon, uh, along with uh, the answers to your question. Um, just a quick uh, uh, heads up, uh, we're going to conduct a guest leave uh, uh, field operation and optimization training uh, the first week of December. Um, it will be uh, a a via Zoom application. So uh, if you are uh, interested in this uh, particular training, uh, do uh, let us know. Uh, this is the, 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 the course structure of the training. Um, we are actually giving a very, very good uh, early bird uh, uh, prize uh, to those who would like to uh, register before uh, 20th November. And also, if you have some friends that would like to group together uh, to join the training, uh, yeah, with, with a minimum of four person, you can also um, get a very, very good price. So uh, do uh, let us know and, uh, you know, uh, contact us uh, for, the, for the training. And uh, a little bit more on the other trainings that we're conducting as well. So uh, we have uh, an introduction to production technology coming up soon um, in, uh, on the 9th to 12th November. And we have IPM, our field integrated uh, production modeling uh, training also coming up uh, in the, towards the end of November. And of course the guest leave uh, training uh, early December. I'd, okay. I'd like to make one, one comment for you. Sure. On the, on the guest lift course, when you go to your line manager and your line manager whines about how much it costs, tell them that all you have to do is increase production on one well by one barrel a day, and that will give you an increased revenue of about $18,000. Mm. Yeah. 
and and then ask them if they think that's a reasonable investment to invest fifteen hundred dollars for the chance of getting eighteen thousand back. Yep. And see what they have to say. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Good comment. <laughs> um, that. And also, I think some of the people in Malaysia are, are able to get some sort of support in training fees as well. That's right. We are uh, HRGF uh, certified uh, uh, training providers. And of, of course, uh, we can help uh, uh, our customer or the people that are attending our training to actually claim uh, the reimbursement of the training fees from HRGF. So, uh, we will provide that, that assistance to the, to the companies as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, we've come to the end of uh, the, the, the session already. Thank you very, very much uh, to all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, special thanks to Jim and uh, friends that uh, joining us all the way from the US at a very, very late uh, time. Um, I would like to remind everyone again, please uh, do not hesitate to email us if you have any inquiries. Um, the contact details are on the screen and we will share this uh, as well uh, during our follow-up um, uh, feedback um, survey that we will send to you as well. Um, yeah, we hope uh, the session has uh, benefit all of you um, in some ways and we look forward to see you again in our future session. So on behalf of Invigor Energy Team, thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, my name is Fazli. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.